Hi uh, everyone, and thanks a lot for joining us for this webinar today with Permo Group. We are joined by Neil and Chris, uh, both from Permo. So just a bit of, um, before I introduce you to the speakers, just a bit of housekeeping. Um, over on that right-hand side where it says say something nice, uh, that's where you can pop your questions and comments. So as we go through, if you have any questions, uh, pop them in there. There's also that ask a question button, which looks like a question mark in a speech bubble. So anything you want as we go through, pop it in there. And then at the end, we'll put those um, to Neil and Chris. So let's introduce you to our speakers today. First up, we've got Neil. Uh, Neil, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your role at Perma Group, please? Yeah, good afternoon, Joe. Uh, my name's Neil Atkins. I'm the Southern Divisional Sales Manager for Permo Group. Uh, I've been with the business 13 years now, and I've done a few different roles covering a patch on the sub southern coast. Uh, then I did a national account role for uh, for a little bit of time, and I've been managing the southern sales team now for nearly 10 years. Um, so I'm responsible for all the, the the sales team in the south, as long with the sales of all of our brands, Permo, Mycin, and Emeti. Uh, we're talking as well, this is both on the commercial side, specification side and domestic. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we, we, uh, we've we got a relatively strong presence in new build with lots of specifications with some of the national house builders and, and some of the regional ones. And we also look after the merchants as well as the consultants and the M&E contractors uh, that, uh, that are working on some of the projects where we're specified or that we're trying to get specified on. No, perfect. And we've also got Chris. Chris, uh, can you tell us about your role at Perma Group, please? Yeah. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so my name's Chris Hone. Um, I've been in the industry now for for seventeen years. Um, twelve of those, uh, or the most recent twelve, have been with with, with Perma Group uh, in various roles, from regional sales manager to a national key account manager, and then most recently in my current role as as divisional sales manager. I look after the the team in the north and uh, and the team in Scotland as well. Yeah, perfect. And then, Chris, what are we looking at kind of in today's session? What are the things that we're going to cover? Yeah, so, so I guess um, the way we heat our homes is changing. Yeah, uh, Everyone's aware of that. Um, and I think the pace of that change is really starting to increase now. Um, you know, it's been on the horizon for what seemed like forever, and it's it's here now. You know, we're seeing um, a, absolute growth in the amount of air source heat pumps being installed, uh, lots of talk of new initiatives from the government, as well as legislation uh, forcing people that way. Um, and everyone tends to zone in on the heat generator. So so we talk an awful lot about the, the, the air source or the ground source heat pump. Um, but actually, if we're to make these systems as efficient as they can be, we need to consider lots more than that. Um, and so I guess that's that's what we're going to cover in, in, in today's session, along with some of the solutions that we're able to provide. Yeah, perfect. So we will um, crack on with the presentation. If you do have any questions or comments as we go, like I said, uh, pop them where it says say something else on the ask a question button. And then afterwards, we'll pop back up with Neil and Chris um, and we'll pop those questions to you. I'm expecting there to be quite a lot. So, yeah, looking forward to it. Great. Okay, so uh, in today's session, uh, what are we going to cover? So we're going to start with what is low temperature heating uh, and an introduction to, to, to low temperature heating itself. We'll look at why we're all changing to low temperature heating, what's driving the, the mega trend. Um, and then importantly, we'll look at what needs to be considered. It's um, it's a fairly simple concept, but there are other elements which, which people may not be aware of that need to be considered to ensure a system performs properly. And then I'll hand over to Neil, who will go through what the options are um, in terms of system design and, and products. So we'll start with the, the what is low temperature heating. Well, we're all familiar with gas boiler systems. In fact, 23 million homes across the UK have a gas boiler installed. Uh, now, gas and oil boilers traditionally operate on high, uh, high system temperatures, so uh, with a temperature range between 75 and 80 degrees. Um, and a low temperature heating system is designed to operate at a much lower temperature. In fact, um, a condensing boiler can operate at around 55 degrees, which is considered low temperature, but a, um, an air source heat pump, for example, can operate as low as 35 degrees. So clearly there's, there's quite a bit to, to, to consider and, and a low temperature heating system is normally powered by a green alternative such as a, a heat pump. Now that's not to say all low temperature heating systems are. Um, there's a lot of systems being installed at the moment on uh, boilers, so on fossil fuels, but they are being installed as future proofs. So they have larger uh, heat emitters installed 
to ensure that when that property makes a switch to air or seat pump that the, the rest of the system is, is ready for it. There are lots of advantages to, to low temperature heating um, and, and we'll, we'll go through a few of these. Um, first of all, lower energy consumption, which is which is fairly obvious. The lower the temperature, the less energy we're consuming in that system. Um, these these heating systems are generally um, made up of, of sustainable materials. So if you took a, a low temperature heating system with central heating radiators, for example, pretty much the entire system can be recycled at the end of its life. Um, there are studies that show that actually lower temperature heating systems can provide a, a higher level of, of indoor comfort um, because you get a more a more stable uh, more stable environment um, and an indoor climate control. Um, we have more energy source versatility, so we're we're moving away from fossil fuels. Ultimately, we can operate a low temperature system with with a with a gas boiler, of course. Um, but it means that we can now consider much greener alternatives. Uh, material lifespan is, is improved. So if you think of the heat cycle that we're putting through all of these materials, um, whereas previously we were ramping everything up to 85 degrees, for example, uh, we're now operating at much lower temperatures, which puts less thermal stress on, on a lot of the components in the system. Um, Added value. So when we look at a, a property um, with an air source heat pump, uh, market research shows that it's it you know it adds desirability to that property versus an identical property next door which which has a, a fossil fuel heating system. It also gives us some flexibility in the interior design as well. Um, so we can look at when we look at underfloor heating, for example, we no longer have radiators taking up wall space, uh, which means that we can use that wall space for, for, for other uh, items of furniture, for example. And clearly, all of this is, is, is much better for the climate overall. So why the change? And I guess, why now? Well, one thing we know for sure is, is that climate change is on everybody's agenda. It's front and centre of everything that, that we do here at Permo Group, um, and it's, it's front and centre of, of, of all of our, our customers' minds at the moment. Um, greenhouse gas emissions are obviously causing the planet's climate to change. You know, we, we, we all see in the news on a daily basis about the, 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 the planet warming up. Um, and I think actually, I think I think these days you can see in the weather phenomenon that we're seeing on, on a more regular basis that, that we are having a, a detrimental impact on, on the planet's climate. So the UK government, like many others, are targeting net zero. Um, and, and that means that there are significant changes uh, that, that we all need to make. And the government are trying, um, whilst considering the impacts, are trying to, to mandate some of that, which we'll come on to in, in a little while. Um, one of the, the main sources of greenhouse gases is, is actually the you know, climate control of buildings. And that's not just limited to heating, that, that encompasses heating and cooling. But when we heat a property, unless we're using a renewable source, we are burning fossil fuel ultimately to, to heat that property. So when you think about lying in bed at night and your, your boiler is keeping your property at a nice comfortable 18 degrees, whilst you're asleep, your property is, is consuming fossil fuel. And, and you multiply that by the... The, the, the hundreds of millions of properties across the planet and you can see why it has such an impact. So if we look at why indoor climate comfort is, is important, um, this slide uh, has got some, some stats on it from the European Commission um, and it's, it states here, the first box there, 90% of our lives are spent indoors and I, um, when I first saw this slide I thought that can't be right. So I, I went away and did some some of my own calculations and looked at my own life and then and then and, um, and was immediately quite depressed to see that I spend more than ninety percent of my life indoors. Um, so I've been making a, a conscious effort to go and walk the dog a little bit more. But it shows how important it is that once we get inside, whether it be our homes, whether it be our workplace, it's important that we're comfortable while we're there. And I guess that demonstrates why approximately 40% of the EU's energy consumption relates to our buildings uh, and our indoor climate systems, whether that be uh, heating or, or cooling. And furthermore, when we look at the types of properties, we shouldn't just consider domestic. So when we look at commercial properties, studies actually suggest that, that you can get improvements in productivity from people if they're comfortable, which sounds pretty obvious, doesn't it? Uh, and, and those improvements can be in, in, in double digit percentage wise. If we couple that with the fact that we're changing 
you know, the, the, both the design of the buildings we're, we're in and how we use them. Um, <clears throat> so cities are expanding. If I could see everyone here today, I'd, I'd, I'd do a show of hands to ask everyone who who lives in a city. Um, but by 2050, close to 70% of the population is expected to live in cities. So you can see that we're, you know, we're urbanizing at quite a fast rate and we're changing the type of properties we live in. We've all seen the high rises and the cranes in, in our city centers, uh, building huge, huge um, uh, complexes of, of apartments and, and flats. And then the second item here on renovation is really probably more important. So 80% of the buildings that we will live in by 2050 will have been built before 2012. So we often talk about renewable heat sources. We talk about air source heat pumps and we, we often link them to new build. And I guess that's the, that's, I mean, that's the easy thing to do, new build, um, putting up a new property. You can build the property as firmly efficient as you like and putting an air source heat pump in, you'll get a fantastic performing system. But we need to consider renovation. We need to consider those 80% of the properties that have already been built more than 10 years um, that we'll live in by 2050. We need to make them uh, energy efficient as well. And I'll come on to, to some of the ways we do that. So I mentioned earlier about the government's target for, for net zero. Um, what well, if they're going to meet that target, they, they have to drive us towards um, ch making changes and low temperature heating is one of them. Um, moving to low temperature heating significantly cuts CO2 emissions from both commercial and domestic buildings. Um, we can see from the latest updates to part L of the building regulations that they are enforcing low temperature heating across the new build sector. Um, and current plans will actually see an outright ban of gas boilers in the new build uh, sector from from only next year. You know, so we we're now on the on the cusp of a ban for um, fossil fuel boilers um, in in new build. That that date felt a long way in the, in the future. Uh, some time, you know, not not too long ago, and it's you know it's on our doorstep now. And when we consider the move away from gas boilers, heat pumps really do look likely to be the product to replace them. We could we could talk about you know, we could have a debate now about about what the the heat source of the future is, whether it's uh, whether it's hydrogen, for example. You know, we know there are lots of, of businesses investing in that. Um, but what we know is that air source heat pump, you know, the market for air source heat pumps is, is expanding exponentially, um, and air, air source heat pumps are a real um, convenient solution to, to low temperature heating and renewable heating in in both existing and new build properties in the refurb market there are some government grants available uh, to assist uh, the cost for homeowners such as eco4 uh, the warmer home scheme and, and nest um, however there is some uh, instability we i'm sure we're all aware that the government recently delayed the implementation of the, the clean heat market mechanism um, which is designed to boost heat pump sales across the country. Um, again, there, you know, there are arguments, but it, it, it probably wasn't. I think it was a well-intended scheme, but but maybe uh, some of the design wasn't wasn't too well thought through. So, I think we will see that come back, um, but but I'm, I'm not sure when. So what do we need to consider? Um, and as I've said before, this isn't just new build. We have to start thinking about retrofit on low temperature heating systems. And that brings us on to the fabric of the building. Is the building suitable for a low temperature heating system? Um, now, energy performance certificates or EPCs were introduced in 2007, uh, and they tell us a lot about how properties have, have developed. Um, and across England and Wales, the average energy efficiency rating in a property is band D. And it's widely considered, um, and, and I, I know from various heat pump manufacturers, but that they believe a, a property in band D or above is suitable for, for low temperature heating. But the graph on the left shows, I guess, some of the challenge. So when we look at the older properties, the EPC or the energy efficiency score rating is much lower. So there may be things that we need to do to the fabric of the building to make that property suitable before we put the low temperature heating system in. And that includes, for example, uh, more energy efficient glazing. Um, I used to say double glazing here, but people have pointed out we've moved on from double glazing now and there's, there's all sorts of triple glazing, um, energy reflective glazing. Um, 
And there are also more simple things that we can do, like cavity insulation. There's lots of properties out there that have a cavity that isn't insulated. Um, so we could do cavity insulation and uh, we'll have seen you know, on the roads uh, around where we live, um, external insulation being installed on, on older properties. And that is an example of getting a property ready to have a low temperature heating system installed. The design and control of the system is also really important. So, so a low temperature system uh, requires a higher flow rate and at a higher flow rate, the pressure drop in a pipe increases substantially. So if we double the flow rate, we quadruple the resistance across that system. That has to be taken into account when we design a system. We can no longer put a heat pump in where there was once a boiler and just put some slightly bigger radiators in we have to consider the, the full system if we're going to get that system to design uh, to, to operate efficiently and perform at its best. I read an article only this week in the news um, about heat pumps um, uh, and it was trying to dispel the myth that heat pumps don't work in freezing temperatures and they absolutely do that you know, they can they're still twice as efficient as a boiler even at minus 10 degrees outside but the system has to be designed in order for that that that, uh, that heat pump to perform properly, um, thermostatic controls save energy. So um, the installation of TRVs on radiators allows greater control. Every degree of overheating when we when we heat a property costs money and adds money to the heating bill of a property. Um, and low temperature systems need to have enhanced control. It's no longer um, uh, uh, it's no longer effective just to turn the system on when you want to be warm and then turn it off entirely when you're satisfied. Um, in order to, to, to make the system perform at its best, we need to make the, the temperature more stable. Uh, and that includes set, uh, setback temperatures um, because low temperature heating systems can take longer to respond than, than traditional fossil fuels. Um, and system design is absolutely crucial. So if we... Um, if we talk about how important a system, I think we're all aware how important a system, uh, the system design is when you're connecting a load of radiators to a boiler. When we connect them to, to an air source heat pump or under floor heating to an air source heat pump, that system design goes from being really important to critical. So the system has to be designed effectively if that heat pump is going to be uh, is going to perform at its best. The, the system design, so your emission of heat and control of the heat, so your underfloor heating or, or emitters, um, your control settings, thermostatic radiator valves, all have an impact on how that heat pump performs and the coefficient of performance on the heat pump. Um, and to ensure that it's as efficient as possible, we need to consider everything and how it all works together. That is why, for example, the boiler upgrade scheme for air source heat pumps requires uh, MCS approved designs uh, to be done with every install and that's to, to ensure that the design has been fully considered. Uh, in new build systems we're increasingly seeing underfloor heating being used because it's absolutely ideal for lower temperatures, it frees up the wall space and is arguably a, a more desirable way of, of heating a home. Um, in retrofit, however, it's probably more common to see uh, larger radiators being installed uh, because underfloor heating can be a costly option um, in retrofit. But we do see underfloor heating being installed in, 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 in some projects and some user operate a, a mixed system. So underfloor heating downstairs with radiators upstairs. Um, and I guess as a, as a manufacturer, we're fairly uniquely positioned to be able to provide both uh, and, and provide an impartial view on which is best. And as lower temperature heating is becoming more, more prevalent, um, we are seeing new options come into the market, such as fan assisted radiators, um, which leads me to, to hand over to, to my colleague, Neil, who will take you through some of the, the options available. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, I think there's some really good points there about uh, things to consider in low temperature heat systems and uh, the legislation changes and, and different bits and pieces. I think it it's clear, isn't it, that uh, this just isn't as straightforward as um, the traditional heating systems that we're all used to. Uh, and I think it strikes me that at this time of really unprecedented change, it's really worth all of us kind of collaborating together and engaging with everyone else in the industry I suppose there's some some great organizations out there I guess Installer Magazine would be one of them and then 
some of the industry bodies like the HHIC, uh, the Heating and Hot Water Industry Council, uh, CIPHE, the Chartered Institute for Plumbing and Heating and Engineers. You know, these organisations have some of the most experienced and uh, uh, and clever people that are, that are uh, heavily involved in them. Uh, and they've all got bucket loads of content that they readily share with their members. Um, and it just, you know, it, it seems like at this time it's well worth engaging with with those guys, as well as the manufacturers of, of the products that uh, that are being installed in these systems. Um, there's, there's no one better place to, uh, to, to, to have information readily at hand about the features and benefits and, and suitability of, of the different products that are, that are being installed in these systems. Likewise, some of the, uh, the mainline merchants are, have uh, dedicated divisions now to, towards renewables and, and they're pretty well placed to stay abreast of all of the, the changes and, and, uh, and the latest uh, products that are available on the market. So um, yeah, really worth uh, consulting and collaborating with, with everyone involved. Um, so I think for the next part of this presentation, we're going to sort of do a bit more of a deep dive on some of the major considerations, particularly the heat source uh, and then latterly the, the heat emitters. I guess those are some of the major considerations for uh, any low temperature heat system. And uh, I, at this point, it's probably worth pointing out that Perma Group, we don't manufacture heat pumps and we don't manufacture uh, boilers, but I think we should spend a bit of time in the scope of this webinar uh, going through a couple of the major options available on the market. So probably the most popular uh, heat source that's being installed in low temperature heating systems currently is the condensing boiler. And this works in a similar way to traditional boiler, uh, except it's significantly more efficient. So traditional boiler will lose a fair amount of energy that it it, uh, it takes in uh, via the flue in the form of uh, like hot gas um, whereas a, so a condensing boiler uses a secondary heat exchanger to harness that wasted energy and return it back to the heating system now this only works when the return temperature of the system is below 54 degrees and that's why when the update to Part L in 2021 uh, came into force and the government mandated that all new new build heating systems should operate at below 55 degrees. Uh, this saw a massive increase in demand for the condensing boiler. Actually though, it really starts driving the efficiencies of the product when, when those temperatures are even lower, like 45. Uh, so that, that's one of the reasons why um, the condensing boiler has been quite so popular. Um, and when it's running at that temperature, you can look at, you can see sort of efficiencies of up to 99% on a, a condensing boiler system, which is a massive improvement on the traditional boilers uh, that we that we know and that used to be commonplace. Um, however, this is all well and good currently, but in 2025, as Chris mentioned, we're looking at an outright ban on fossil fuel fired heat sources, including uh, the, the uh, condensing boiler. And what looks likely to take its place is the air source heat pump. Now there are all sorts of different varieties of heat pump available on the market from uh, air to air, air to water, ground source, water source um, and in the scope of this webinar I'll probably don't have time to go through all of the different options it looks like and, and the manufacturer invested most heavily in the uh, in the air to water heat pump um, but they all work similar way um, so the uh, they use uh, two heat exchangers and uh, the so the magic happens as the refrigerant gas changes from uh, uh, gas into liquid. Uh, so when the compressor increases the pressure of that gas, it turns into a liquid and that delivers heat into its surroundings, which is then obviously delivered into the heating system via uh, the heat exchanger. So it's really, uh, really good, clever technology, been around for a while in, fridges and uh, air conditioning um, 
but the the, the main thing about uh, what heat pumps can achieve is the conversion rate so uh, uh, it can take a kilowatt of electrical energy convert that into four kilowatts or more of energy into heating system which is really really impressive so if we're talking about condensing boilers working at 99 percent efficiency uh these these uh, heat pumps can operate at over 400 percent uh which is great there are obviously various factors that influence the performance of the product um and we measure that by uh, what we call the coefficient of performance so the table on the right hand side demonstrates uh, the differences between um, different flow and return temperature system designs and, and what that delivers in terms of the um, it also uh, it also has an impact where these heating systems are installed so in countries where the um, where the outdoor temperature is very very cold that's going to have an impact on on the COPs that you can get out of your heat pump um, that said, you know, even in coldest temperatures, heat pumps will operate at, at COPs of two or three. Um, so I think there's a bit of a myth and uh, misinformation around out there that um, that heat pumps, you know, don't work in, in cold temperatures, isn't there? We've all, we've all heard that, but uh, that's just not true. It's uh, as long as they're on a, a system that's designed um, correctly, then, uh, then they absolutely will work. Perhaps not as, as efficiently as, as in other settings, but they certainly will heat the room that's, uh, that, 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 they're, that they're intended for. Um, moving on then into heat emitters. So this is probably an area we would say would be our expertise. We manufacture all, all, all the major options available in the domestic market of, of uh, heat emitters. So underfloor heating has been uh, designed and installed in this country uh, for decades and goes hand in hand really with uh, low temperature heating systems. Um, warm water is pumped through the pipes in the floor, which is controlled by a manifold and a blending valve um, with actuators and, and room stats uh, controlling the flow and the temperature of the water. Um, the floor effectively then becomes the radiator delivering an even heat throughout the building. And uh, this this system uh, has, like I say previously, mostly been in, in, in installed into new build. However, recent innovations in the market have seen uh, lots of different retrofit systems uh, becoming uh, available like microboard. So it's a good option uh, for both new build and retrofit. Um, tends to be more, uh, more frequently installed on ground floors because it's still quite costly and time consuming putting it into upper floors. Main thing with underfloor heating is it's quite a different system to control, particularly when it's in new build and, and the pipes installed into, you know, a thick layer of greed. Uh, lots of the energy required uh, in this system is to get that screed heated up to um, to the right temperature. And so you really just want to find a, a temperature that you're happy with the system being at uh, and kind of leave it as, as much as possible. I guess in traditional systems, everyone's used to turning the heating off at night and then having it come back on um, half an hour before they wake up, uh, going downstairs, feeling the radiator warm, and uh, and then knocking it off during the day when they're out and about um, at work or, or what have you. Uh, with underfloor heating, it, it, it's really controlled totally differently. And um, if you don't want to leave it on the same setting all the time, fair enough but you wouldn't really want to set it back more than a couple of degrees at night um, otherwise you're then using lots of energy to reheat the screed whereas if you leave it just to trickle on and off um, you'll get the best out of uh, out of your system and this will have a positive impact on your COP. There's a bit of debate a bit of a debate at the moment um, with some of the heat pump manufacturers who are sort of suggesting that you know, contrary to current building regs and advice, it's better just to have one stat controlling a whole floor as opposed to individual stats in individual rooms, which is what um, current building regs uh, recommendations are. So um, I can understand why you would want uh, less um, of the on and off that, that, that individual zones will, will 
will signal back to the, uh, the heat source. But what that will, what impact having only one stat will have on, you know, the kitchen when you're cooking or, or different room temperatures, um, I guess is to be debated. And it's just one of, of many, I suppose, debates at the moment about the best way forward with, with low temperature systems. Um, so like I said, worth uh, worth consulting with uh, with everyone involved to, to keep on top of what's uh, what's happening and what people are thinking. On to radiators then. Um, historically, radiators have been fitted in traditional high temperature systems for centuries. I think the first radiator was a, a cast iron um, product that was uh, developed back in the 1800s. Um, more recently, we've, we've, we've had the traditional steel panel radiator with us for, for decades, and um, it's still a it's still a genuine option on on low temperature systems. Uh, some rumours go around saying you have to have underfloor heating, but that that's absolutely not the case. You, you just need larger radiators compared to your traditional systems. Um, we're seeing an increase in demand for triple panel, uh, larger double panel radiators, um, as well as verticals. Uh, the key really is the uh, increase in the surface area. So. On a traditional system, about 60% of the heat that's delivered into a room via a radiator is done via convection rather than radiation. Um, but when the temperature of the system uh, is dropped down to sort of 55 or below, that has a massive impact on the, on the amount of convection that, that will be produced. Uh, and therefore, the, um, the surface area of the radiator becomes far more important. And, and that, that's why we're seeing much larger radiators um, being selected. I think uh, also with a lot of our new build customers whose heating systems we do designs for, um, we're having lots of conversations with them about how best to fit these larger radiators into their properties. Uh, it's quite common in new build now for big, large open plan, kitchen diners and, and large spaces without lots of walls. So that makes um, where you're facing the radiator really quite important and uh, the vertical style gives an option I think that, um, that that's quite attractive to developers where they haven't got large amount of space for longer larger radiators um, across the limited wall space that they have that they have available another product that we're seeing significant increase in demand for is fan assisted um, products so uh, Fan assisted radiators are a good example of that. And, and uh, the product I'm showing you here is a, a ULO E2 from the Meissen range. Um, you can't see from the picture, but it's actually got quite a sleek flat front uh, to it. And uh, effectively, it's a steel panel radiator with a bank of electric powered computer fans that run through the convectors. And so it's got, also got some intelligent controls which will sense when there's a high demand for heat in the room. And uh, when that's the case, the fans will kick on at, at high speed and when they do that that will increase the output of the radiator by up to 60% and then as the room reaches temperature that fan will drop back to medium then to low and then eventually it will, it will turn off and that means you can have a similar sized radiator to your, your, your old one that was on a high temperature system running on a low temperature um, without taking up a huge amount more wall space but giving you a similar heat output I guess one of the considerations here is that it requires an electrical supply, um, but it's a really good option where space is is an issue. Another benefit to this product is you can just turn the fans on when it's warm, and that will give you a ambient sort of cooling, a summer breeze effect. Another fan assisted product is our uh, iVector S2, which is a uh, low water content, high output fan convector. So it's got an aluminium heat exchanger inside and uh, it's got very quick response heat up uh, times. Um, you can uh, operate this product on uh, in a wall mounted setting. It will also, as you can see from the image there, um, fix to the ceiling. Um, you can have that recessed in the ceiling and recessed in the wall. Um, it's got very intelligent controls again with different fan speeds that modulate depending on the demand of the of the room um, and it works hand in hand with uh, low temperature uh, systems like we're, like we're discussing. At the moment, the controls on this product are, are, are very good. So you can have an in integrated control in the unit. 
you can have uh, a remote control for, for the ceiling mounted um, products. You can have them all linked up to one uh, BMS system. Uh, so again, controllability is, um, is a really positive feature here and it gives you that rapid heat up um, time compared to uh, traditional radiators. Um, so that kind of covers the major heat emitting options that uh, that are available in the market. And um, as you've seen, hopefully uh, they're all products that we manufacture within the, the Permo group. So to summarize then, I think the, uh, the requirement to move to low temperature heating systems is clear. Climate change is having a massive impact on, on all of us uh, in this country and, and, and across the planet. Um, and governments around the world are mandating uh, the transition from fossil fuels over to renewable energy. And the significant uh, portion of, of the uh, greenhouse gases that are emitted in this country are, are related to uh, managing the climate within buildings. So, you know, we need the transition um, away from fossil fuels. Uh, and the best way to do that is to move to lower temperature heating systems. As we've seen, that generates a lot of things to consider from new legislation and different parameters around the heating design, uh, the pipe diameters, the controls. It kind of brings absolutely everything into scope and um, it's very different to how it was previously. So I think it's really important that we all use these kind of platforms to discuss the changes inform ourselves of what's happening and what's going on and, and, and stay ahead of the game. Um, as we discussed, air to water heat pumps look like they're going to be the product of choice moving forward, um, particularly in new build, uh, but also in retrofit as, as we move through the, the energy transition. Um, and really they're suitable for, uh, uh, for whatever we uh, want to use them for, as long as we design the system um, accordingly. So. Now then, uh, thank you for listening. I'm going to, uh, at this stage, pass back to Joe, because I can see there's um, lots of questions coming into the chat just before I go. We'll obviously answer all your questions now, but if, uh, if there's anything else that springs to mind after the webinar, or you've got anything in particular you'd like to, uh, to, to discuss with us, we'd love to hear from you, and you can get in touch with us via any of these um, media listed here. So back to you, Joe. Brilliant. Thanks a lot, guys. If you do have any questions like Eamon and Ashley have got, um, pop them in the chat box uh, now and we'll put those over to uh, Neil and Chris. But Neil, when we went through that presentation, the, the fan convector that goes into the ceiling that you can um, install kind of up above, that was one of the ones that really stuck out because that's not something that I'd seen before. Um, so how, how aware are like installers, specifiers and like the government about these emitters that aren't standard like radiators? And Chris, you're on, uh, sorry, Neil, you're on mute down at the bottom uh, right hand side if you could unmute yourself. Thank you. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah, same question. It's got, it's got to be done on a Teams call or a Zoom meet, hasn't it? Has Someone to, speaks yeah. On mute. Um, there's definitely room for all of us to increase our knowledge of, of what's available in the market. Like I said in the presentation, there's the landscape's changing all the time and manufacturers and, and businesses are bringing out new and innovative solutions um, all, all the time as we transition to low temperature. Actually, that product is a product we're now in the third generation of, of having within the group. I think one of the benefits of being part of a, a group that spans across the world from, you know, from China to the US with a, with a big, big presence in Europe is that we, we've got exposure to lots of markets that are at different stages of this energy transition. So um, if you look at places like Germany and the Nordics, that they've had low temperature heating systems in for a very, very long time, a lot, lot, lot more established than they are over here. And that means that we've got the benefit of some of these uh, products that, you know, really innovative, provide heating and cooling um, and uh, at, at, and work perfectly well with, with the low temperature systems that, that, that are about to become installed commonplace in, in this country. So definitely room for everyone, as I've mentioned, to, to stay in, on top of 
all the developments that are going on within the industry. It's, like I say, it's really unprecedented times. So. And then, yeah, for you guys as the manufacturer, it's just kind of that kind of education, education, education piece, isn't it? It's like, we've got these, this is how they work. These are the, the applications that they suit for. Like you said, they now do heating and cooling. Cooling isn't massively in the UK, but the temperature does seem to be getting hotter. Um, so there's all these options that isn't just, yeah, we need bigger rads on the wall that we're then going to put a sofa in front of. Absolutely. Yeah, I think we, we said the other day, didn't we, the way the climate's changing and, and uh, that, that, you know, in my estate, there's people who've got air conditioning installed that works totally separately from their heating system. And um, you might think that a, a product that can do both running at low temperature might be a better, better option. And probably cheaper because you don't have to then invest in both upfront costs for the products that can now do the same thing but obviously yeah it's it's dependent on um on the project isn't it so Eamon has asked you neil do you think it's appropriate to mix different heat emitters within a system for example underfloor in public areas and rads in rooms with intermittent occupancy we we spoke as well about underfloor downstairs and maybe radiators upstairs so mixing between emitters uh, for different sort of projects what's your what's your advice i think yeah, that's a great question Eamon. thank you for putting that in the chat yep definitely makes sense and it's something we see uh, commonplace um, at the moment so lots of our customers are asking us to design or to quote for heating systems where you've got underfloor heating downstairs and, and radiators upstairs and it makes sense you know because as I talked about earlier with underfloor heating you kind of want it on all the time when it's in areas that are getting used more uh, traditionally you want your living room and those downstairs areas where you you're uh, where you're where you, where you live more, you want them to be warmer, whereas upstairs you need that, uh, you don't necessarily need it to be as warm and you want that flexibility of temperature. So that, that mix system really does uh, make a lot of sense. And it, it, it makes sense for us as we manufacture the components of the underfloor heating system and we manufacture the radiators and, you know, it's, 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 it's a definitely, um, it's the type of system we're seeing in demand a lot at the moment yeah and then chris you mentioned this as part of your presentation that kind of debate about um you were uh, underfloor heating versus radiators for heat pump systems and that is something that is kind of going on you guys manufacture both products and you sit as kind of more of an independent voice so what's your kind of advice um if people are reading things and thinking i'm gonna have to get rid of all of my radiators or i'm gonna have to put in underfloor I think the main thing to bear in mind is that both have their strengths. Um, now, we're fairly uniquely positioned in being able to, to, to offer an opinion on both because we can provide both and, and, and be fairly impartial in it. Um, you, know, you know, there are benefits to radiators in, in install cost um, and there are benefits to underfloor heating and space saving. Um, and actually, we're seeing in, in a lot of systems um, that the best system for, for, for that property is a mix, actually. Um, um, so I think nearly 80% of underfloor heating renovation uh, installations are underfloor heating downstairs with radiators upstairs. And the two can be installed on the same system with absolutely no problem at all, as long as they're correctly designed to perform with the, the, the heat generator. Um, you know, as we're talking today, mate, uh, an air source heat pump, for example. Um, so yeah, they're, they're both absolutely suitable. Um, I, I guess I'd, I'd encourage people to get in touch with a, with a heating professional to, 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 to discuss their specific requirements. Um, but yeah, we see lots of articles, you know, from um, from both sides. Um, so so underfloor heating companies saying that radiators are, are no good anymore. And vice versa, radiator companies saying that underfloor heating is no good. And, and actually, the, the truth of the matter is they can both perform absolutely fantastically well on low temperature systems as long as the, you know, it's designed appropriately. Um, yeah, we just had one uh, a question come in from uh, Lucinda as well. Many of our buildings in our portfolio are off grid. Are there many options for electric powered systems? And would we see energy efficiency compared with the fossil fuel uh, options that we have now? Who would be the best to answer that one, gents? I'll have a I'll have a stab at that one, Joe. So we yeah, do, do. There, there are lots of uh, electric only systems that are available on the market. We're seeing again a big big spike in demand for some of our electric oil filled radiators. So we do a range of radiators from standard panel rad, 
flat fronted to some of the more designer decorative and column radiators and they're filled with biodegradable uh, vegetable oil for want of a better term with a heating element and smart controls uh, on the side or via an app um, and they provide a really nice radiant and convected heat into a room with good efficiency so you, if you put one kilowatt of electricity in you'll get a kilowatt of heat out it's not quite the same as uh, as some of the heat pumps that we've been talking about today but they are incredibly efficient if you then combine that maybe with a storage battery if you make the most of the low cost heating tariffs that seem to be becoming more popular at the moment at night especially with people with EV, uh, electronic vehicles and, and charging the, the vehicles at night when it's low demand and low cost then you can have a really really good option in terms of um, cost and efficient heating where you don't have gas um, or or you, or a heat pump isn't suitable for your property so absolutely i, I think just, just to add to that slightly so i'm i'm, I'm going to guess listen to that uh, being off grid and using fossil fuel it's either lpg tanks or or, or or oil boilers oil tanks um and air source heat pumps are actually an ideal replacement for those kind of systems because an air source heat pump is is actually an electrical uh, powered system as well um, so, so it's ideal for being off uh, the, the gas grid as it were yeah we, we kind of mentioned it before the the kind of point of moving over to renewables or moving over to not burning fossil fuels is is to yeah not burn fossil fuels essentially. so every kilowatt hour um save not burning something um is kind of what the government wants and there are other options aren't there like you said uh, did you mention that you've got a kind of heat pump cylinder that can provide duct out and provide the hot water you could provide you could team that up with radiators um the electric rads like electric showers so uh, it, it isn't one for this webinar but do you think there is a kind of wider conversation to be had where it isn't just yeah heat pumps heat networks or hydrogen it's 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 less straightforward than it was before uh, because there are so many different solutions available now. Um, previously, uh, you know, I could put a ring around the map behind me, and you could you could guarantee that every house within that radius had got gas boiler and and, and central heating yep. radiators. This is changing now, and, and and different properties require different things. As going back to to, to, to Eamon's question, different rooms actually can have different solutions depending on how that room is used. Um, so, so we do need to consider the systems more. We need to consider how the property is being used. Um, so it, it, it is a little bit more complicated. But the great the great thing is we've got loads and loads of, 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 of um, suitable heating solutions within our group. Um, so, so please reach out to us on, on the details that have been provided, and, uh, and we'll, we'll be able to go into a little bit more detail on, on specific uh, cases. Yeah, you guys just keep, as manufacturers, you just keep making new innovations and it's difficult for everyone to keep up, isn't it? That's the problem. Yeah. Uh, Matt's asked, uh, customers like metallic or even black decorative radiators nowadays, are these suitable on low temp systems or does it have an effect on the output? Thanks for your question, Matt. I think um, the best, the best colour for a heat emitter is definitely white. Uh, one of the most common questions we're getting particularly from new builders around towel warmers and I think the fashion for a long time has been to have a chrome towel warmer in your bathroom and very quickly that's becoming uh, just non-existent because it really does have a massive impact on the output of the of the radiator so having a chrome towel warmer will decrease the output by about 30 percent so when you're already wow. putting that towel warmer on a low temperature system the outputs are a uh, uh, significant de decrease obviously so just having chrome is definitely not an option matte black and other colors have much less of an impact it's to do with the chrome uh, finish that, that really really hampers the um, hampers the output so designer radiators definitely something that's becoming more fashionable and more uh, requested in both retrofit and in new build and the, they it will have a slight impact on the output, but it's nothing like as bad as a as a chrome finish. I like you said they're not just emitters; they're more and more and more important. Aren't they thirty percent is a is a big old number, whereas before, yeah, they were almost. It was a very kind of set thing that people didn't really pay attention to. But if they're going to be bigger because of the low temp, then you might want them to look more decorative. If that has an effect Absolutely. on the what's the what's the trade off? Because I'd definitely opt for the. Um, 
for the efficiency over the color, but some people might like color. Like we said about the heat pump systems themselves, they're going outside. Some of them look maybe better than others. So, and this is the kind of education of the consumer that the installer or the specifier will have to go through, isn't it? It is. We've, we've just launched a, a towel rail that's specifically designed for, for low temperature seat, uh, heating systems uh, called, called the Mice and Topaz. Um, and it's effectively a, um, a, a double panel towel rail, if you like, with, with two rows of, 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 of collector tubes. Um, and towel rails, as, as Neil said, are, are not great heat emitters because um, they don't have a massive surface area and then people love them in chrome. Um, and, and then you end up with huge 1800 high ladders going up a wall in, in a small ensuite. Um, so that's the, the Topaz really is a product designed to, to, to remedy that. Um, and, and, and just to, to, to echo Neil's point there, we, we're not doing that product in Chrome because it defeats the object. So you know, as standard, it comes in white, but we do have a range of stocked colors um, such as silvers and, and, uh, um, and anthracite. Um, um, which which cater for for, for the customer that wants a, you know, a nicer looking product without having a huge detrimental impact on the heat output. Uh, we're kind of wrapping up. We'll go on to the hours. So if you do have any more questions, please do pop them in. Ashley asked about fan coils. Yeah, so I think Neil went on to, to cover a little bit about fan coils. Uh, so we have a range of fan convectors within within our portfolio. Um, the, the newest version being our, our iVector uh, S2, um, which, which Neil covered specifically, which we have. Um, so we have a range of on-wall, in-wall, on-ceiling and in-ceiling. Um, we also have uh, Kickspace fan convectors uh, for, for kitchens. Um, so we've got a huge range. If there's, if there's any specific requirement, because there wasn't a lot of detail in the question, if there's anything you, you want answering specifically, please feel free to ask us. Uh, but again, um, the the i vector is absolutely ideal for low temperature systems it's got low water content you've got a heat exchanger in there with with a fan along the bottom um you can get a fantastic performance system even in large areas so 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 it's ideal for commercial applications um it's um it's it you know it it, it is a great solution for, for low temperature systems and then chris you mentioned sort of the legislation that's come in some of the schemes um we got the boiler upgrade scheme running uh clean heat market mechanism which has been put back there will be a new government next month um so yeah i think all this yeah. stuff has, has been kind of put on the back burner but what would you say some of the easy wins would be for the next government what would you like to see as a manufacturer to kind of unleash or help the, this kind of low term rollout um I, I i think what we need is a bit of um uh, stability uh, i think we need to we need to know what's what's coming um and uh, I, I think that um we need guidance and, and clarity on on what's happening and, and for them to stick to it um ultimately um so that people can start making uh, decisions accordingly um I, I don't think instability helps anybody yeah and like you said when there's a pathway it's easier for you guys as manufacturers to react because you know what what um what you know what systems work in well it's easy for the installers it's easy for the specifiers because they know what the end goal is when if we're kind of in a bit of a flux people are still kind of staying on their hands or sticking to what you kind of know yeah absolutely yeah bro we will round off there if you do have any more questions please pop them in the chat box and we can answer them via the chat um neil you did pop the slide up at the end but for anyone that wants more information or wanted to talk more about some of the specific products or wanted you know specific training or anything like that what's your advice where do people go from here yeah we'd love to get in you know we'd love to speak to you we'd love to engage with you guys so give us get in touch with us with our email um call the office we're on linkedin we're on uh facebook we will also be at the installer show coming up later on in the month. Uh, we'd love to have a chat with you there in person, but if there's anything specific you want to email or talk to us about on social media, then by all means, please do get in touch. We'd love to hear from you. I wasn't even asking for that installer show plug. So yeah, very well. Thank you very much. Yeah. Join us uh, <laughs> at the end of the month and then you can go and talk to Neil and Chris about all the, all the um, emitter options that we've got. So thank you everyone uh, for your, for joining us today. Thank you, uh, Neil and Chris for your time and your presentation.